G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today I've decided to share the contents of a webinar I was recently participating in um, with Capricot Vin Zero. Um, unfortunately, I don't think everyone got to see it, of course, um, so I decided to share the content, which luckily I can. Um, so in this case, we'll be talking about leveraging the power of Dynamo to increase productivity in Revit. It's more of a general overview of some examples of how Dynamo is useful, but also an overview of just why automation is valuable to businesses. Um, if you've seen my channel for a while, you'll probably have seen a lot of this before. Um, so maybe you might want to cut to later in the video where I talk about Dynamo. But I hope it's a useful introduction and also potentially helps business owners or managers understand why this might be important to them as well. So of course, thank you to Capricot for inviting me to present this topic originally. Um, and if you do want to access their copy of the webinar, it should be available on demand through them. So feel free to contact them if you like. Now, my microphone quality wasn't great in the webinar. Um, I have been struggling with my microphone quality for a little while, unfortunately. Um, so hopefully this is a easier one to understand. So just a little bit about me briefly. Um, so if you haven't met me before or seen me on the channel, uh, my name is Gavin Crump. I have an architectural background, a bachelor's and a master's, and I'm currently working in Adelaide, Australia. I've been working for about 10 to 11 years now, uh, typically in architecture and more recently focusing on BIM and also more recently than that computation. So I currently work as a BIM slash computation specialist um, for Architectus and on the side I do a little bit of BIM consulting. So I did historically consult through BIM Guru, but have more switched that focus over to content and course creation. Um, and now I've really moved on um, from my channel for the moment as well. Um, I do come back to it from time to time and hope to soon uh, as well, um, but have you know left behind a, a legacy of videos that hopefully help people. Uh, but I will come back to time to time with more videos and content. So historically I've utilized uh, Autodesk Revit and Rhino uh, in my BIM based technology side. Um, so I do use Dynamo, PyRevit and Grasshopper extensively uh, to get the most out of these platforms as well. Um, I'm of course aware of other platforms out there and have used them all to some capacity to understand what I might be missing out on potentially or you know what I'm gaining through my choices. Um, but I do encourage anyone using BIM software to keep it up. Um, we're all really fighting for the same goal. Um, so regardless of the tools we choose, um, we're all you know doing good work. Uh, so before I start evangelizing about Dynamo and Revit and all that good stuff, um, it's worth just highlighting the value of general automation and why it's important, why it matters, and why I encourage it. So we're all familiar with working with computers by now for the most part, or I hope you are. Um, you know, we know the good things and the bad things, the frustrations, the limitations, and the opportunities. Um, but we're very used to driving things ourselves. Um, we are the human driving the software application. We're not so used to software driving software, at least not you know, from what we witness. Um, but programs like Dynamo offer us the ability to build algorithms, blueprints, instructions for a computer to follow. Um, so this is what we would call an abstracted piece of code. Um, it's built upon layers of programming below the surface um, until eventually it's as simple as us just putting blocks of code together um, that all do things behind the scenes in the computer in its memory um, and really we're just sending instructions. It's pretty cool. But of course we can also write programming at a lower level, um, closer to the computer um, at varying layers. So if you're using Python for example, you're working at a lower level than Dynamo and if you're using C Sharp, you're working at a lower level again if you're using assembly, etc, etc, until eventually it's just switches or diodes flicking on and off. Um, but it's important to understand that this isn't a magic button, it's not a cure-all. There's a lot of work involved in developing these scripts and also building a culture around this in your business. Um, automation can scare people away very quickly if you don't send the message properly. And that message is that we're not getting rid of people, we're giving them back their time to use it more valuably for the business. Um, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of training uh, to develop these tools, particularly if you don't have actual programmers or software developers in-house, uh, which is most architecture firms, most engineering firms these days. Most of them don't have pure software developers. They have people that found their way to this field. Maybe some do, um, but it took a long time for the business to realize that was the right choice to make. We're trying to avoid using multiple people to do someone's job or even a person to do a job. If I can stop someone doing this in my business, I will. Because if I can, I can get them to do more important things that computers aren't as good at doing. Or just things that people enjoy doing. I mean, who actually wants to do this, right? 
Sometimes people say, don't take my job away. Well, if my job was documenting all day, I would actually be looking forward to someone taking my job away. So we're trying to make businesses as productive as possible. So computers are good at a lot of really complicated things. Um, they can make very fast logic-based decisions. This might, you know, summarize some AI out there these days. Logic trees, um, decision pathways. The computers are very good at going quickly through here because behind the scenes, it's really just crunching numbers. It's all it's really doing right at the bottom of the computer. Uh, but how you build that logic is really how you give the computer those logic trees to follow. As well as this, computers are really good at remembering things. Uh, they have memory just like we do, but they're a little bit better at accessing it. Sometimes things might not go quite right, but at the end of the day, computers have total recall. They know how to go to points in the memory banks that have exactly what they need. We're a little bit foggier sometimes in memory. We're not always so quick. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes computers make mistakes too, but it's usually because a person told it to make a mistake without realizing it, um, but you never know. As well as this, computers are really good at repeating themselves. In fact, they thrive on it. Um, a computer is literally computing. It's doing things and it's often doing them again and again and again. People aren't so good at this. We make mistakes, we get bored. We question why we have to do something 10 times in a row. Um, computers are great at this and it's one of the best things about them, I think. And that leads us to visual coding, um, a paradigm that tries to take this introduction to programming and turn it into something more akin to this. This is Scratch, this is being taught to kindergarten students now. They're learning to program, and yes, they can take your jobs, and yes, they just might. But maybe if we learn how to work with people like this, maybe it won't be a problem. So I do encourage that people do at least learn the fundamentals of programming so that all the hard work that this person on the left put in isn't gone to waste on us. Because the people on the left built a lot of really strong foundations that enabled those simpler applications on the right to exist. Below the scenes, there's what we call abstraction, various layers of programming built on top of programming that make it all simpler at the top. Oh, that's cool. Computation, automation, it's problem solving. Taking problems, applying methods to reach a solution. Input, method, output. We can look at this in what we call a node in visual programming typically where we collect an input or inputs, we do something behind the scenes in this block, there's a bit of code being executed here, and we package this into an output or outputs. For example, I can take a very primitive number, uh, a float as we might call it in computing, depending on what type of system we're using, um, but that's too complex, don't worry about it. Um, turning these into geometric primitives like points and then combining these into more creation. So for example, taking these points and a number to generate a cone. Obviously there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes here. We don't actually have to really do a lot, but with some simple instructions, we can start to create more complex outcomes. Until we end up with scripts. Um, obviously they can get big, they can get messy. Uh, you do have to really take care when you build scripts, not to make them too out of control, um, because ultimately you're gonna have to often come back and fix these up or rework them. Um, you can be your own worst enemy as a programmer sometimes if you're not a clean programmer. Um, but that comes with time. Learning your style as a programmer, it takes time. Um, but do focus on it, do aim to develop clean code if you can. So Dynamo for Revit um, is worth briefly talking about. Um, Dynamo being an open source application that allows a visual programming environment such as it to exist. Of course, there are other ones out there, it's not the only one. Um, but Autodesk chose to take Dynamo and adjust it to suit Revit. Um, so taking an open source program, developing on top of it um, in order to do different things with it effectively. So as always, thank you Ian Kyo who made Dynamo uh, for making this whole movement really possible. So Dynamo you could say is the computational design tool for Revit. Of course there's Rhino inside, there's other programs you can go to such as Blender and you can use Fairchock and other engines that do the same sorts of things. Um, but for a lot of people, Dynamo is the go-to solution um, for computation and automation in Revit. Just a very basic example of what doing something in Dynamo looks like. So we take a category of elements, all the walls, and we get their heights. Um, now obviously that's not very useful on its own, but this would be the starting point for a more complicated workflow. Maybe we're trying to assess walls of a certain height that maybe didn't get reinforced. Um, well, we can use Dynamo to very quickly create a verifier to go and report any of these elements back to us to go and investigate. 
One really cool thing about Dynamo is you can develop custom packages for it and share more creative code, more ideas with people around the world that builds upon Dynamo itself. So rather than waiting for Autodesk to add more nodes to Dynamo, you can build your own, or you can borrow nodes from other people that have shared them. For example, I develop a package called Crumple for Dynamo, which contains a lot of nodes that really focus themselves around automation and things that I encounter in BIM management. Eventually, you can build uh, scripts that can be run through Dynamo Player, um, which allows users to not even have to open the Dynamo script itself. Just look at very specific inputs and outputs of the script um, and hope that no errors occur, obviously, because they can't see where they occurred or why they occurred, just that they have. But assuming your, your script is built well, this will enable users to run your scripts without having to be a Dynamo expert. You can also create interfaces in various ways, whether you create WinForms through Python or use C Sharp and generate WPF or XAML forms. Um, you can also, uh, just in this case, just generate forms using a custom package called Data Shapes, which has built its own library that generates WinForms out of very simple components in Dynamo instead. But how does it actually all go into practice? Well, before we jump into some scripts, I'll just briefly talk about how I've used Dynamo and how it might relate back to you. So learning Dynamo can be really challenging at first, especially if you've never programmed. Um, I'd done very little programming before I used Dynamo. I'd played around with some, some hex editing and Super Nintendo ROMs, which is very, very different. Um, and I'd also played with some, some very visual editors in Warcraft 3. Uh, but really I hadn't done any true programming before. So this was a very frustrating first introduction for me made a lot of mistakes, watched a lot of tutorials, and didn't really understand a lot. Um, so what really helped me, and what helps most people, is finding a problem that relates to what you need to solve. That way, when you do solve it, it will give you a personalized reason for learning, and it will also motivate you further, because now you can see things that not only you can do for yourself, but that you can give to other people through your own scripting and coding. And that really is a great motivator. I also recommend that you learn as much as you can about the platform you're automating to make sure that you still take advantage of features that Revit provides, such as filters and view templates and view types, things that you can put hand in hand with your Dynamo workflows to get the best out of both programs. Of course, uh, the Dynamo Primer is the recommended introduction to Dynamo if you're new. And of course, the Dynamo forums are a great place to get help, assuming you've just put a bit of effort in first and shown that to people before asking for help. At Architectus, where I work, uh, we've used Dynamo for a variety of things, but often it's dealing with project-specific scenarios, uh, often facades or complex roofs, where it's difficult to form these objects manually or using the tools that Revit provides out of the box. Um, as well as this, we have learning series in-house and we have a, lot, a library of scripts that people can connect to uh, to get all the good stuff that we develop. Um, we have a very clean standard in-house and we mostly use Python versus custom packages, um, which is something offered to the company through the fact that I've learned Python. Uh, but as you can see, the scripts are very clean and organized and usually have quite a lot of annotation on them. So we do use it for teaching people to code if they want to, but generally prototyping tools before we develop them in PyRevit or C-Sharp. Um, also just developing project specific quick solutions that wouldn't make sense to develop in a more complex environment but coding in a way that people can look at and understand as well. And like I said, we try not to use the custom packages. If we do, we do note very clearly to the user that they will need to get some packages to run a particular tool, because occasionally there are package that, packages that are just that good and they've got that much work in them um, that it's worth actually using them. Uh, but for the most part, we try to avoid it. And when we do scalable solutions, personally, I use PyRevit. Um, it does have some different capabilities to Dynamo, but it doesn't offer the visual environment. So that's the trade-off. And to me, Dynamo is a bigger, is part of a bigger picture for people learning to program in Revit. So personally, I've taken the Python PyRevit pathway for now. We'll probably fall back onto C Sharp at some point. Um, but for you, you might find Dynamo is enough. It just depends on what you need it for. And that's just an example of the actual PyRevit toolbar I'm developing. So we're gonna jump into some actual examples of Dynamo workflows in action. Um, that relate to everyday tasks. So I've picked um, what I call some repeatable time sinks. 
things that can take a lot of time or waste a lot of time, especially if companies are doing these things in lots of projects across the company, often inconsistently, often incorrectly, um, and sometimes just, you know, just at, at the waste of time. So we're gonna look at initiating project levels, creating plans for those levels, and then sheets from Excel, and finally placing sheets, um, placing those views onto sheets using an Excel guide, and then looking at a bulk revisioning script that uses a custom interface. But you can access these at the link below. If you look up Aussie BIM Guru on GitHub, you can find me, and under Dynamo scripts, uh, round about today's date, you'll find a zip file that contains a whole bunch of these scripts that we'll be running today. So do, um, do take note of the, some key things that I've done in my scripts, and I will point them out as I go. Um, but it's important to think about what happens to your scripts when they run in various states. Let's say I'm creating views. What if those views already exist by name? I'm gonna hit an error. Something's gonna go wrong. The user's gonna freak out, and they might not come back to Dynamo again because they think it doesn't work. So there is a good amount of work required eventually in Dynamo when you start building for other people to build your scripts to deal with errors and scenarios that might occur. And I'll show you some common ones that I've dealt with and how I've dealt with them. It's important as well to provide inputs and outputs for Dynamo Player. Otherwise users might assume the script runs through Dynamo Player and just hit play anyway, um, which can sometimes cause problems. So I do recommend trying to build all your scripts to be compatible with Dynamo Player if possible. As well as this, um, you'll notice that I group and comment and keep the nodes and the wires really clean in my scripts. And I do recommend getting in this habit really early just to make sure that you can come back to your code cleanly and other people can also follow you. Otherwise it can be quite an intimidating experience to work with one of your scripts for both you and other people. Now all these scripts only took me a few hours to make, um, but if you're a business decision maker, note this isn't just how quick this is to build generally. Um, this is because I've spent a lot of time learning and mastering the use of Dynamo in Revit. Um, so if you are building a team, uh, you can either give your team time to learn and build them up, or you can hire experts to save that time, but of course, you know, they skip the whole culture that comes with it. So it's up to you how this goes, but just don't, don't expect that just this will be easy for everyone in your business. Um, you do need to give people time to learn or time to develop, and it won't be as quick as necessarily what I'm doing. So let's just jump into the scripts. Okay, so I'm just in a sample model in Revit 2024 here. I've got two floor plans, a floor plan and a ceiling plan and I have a sheet with one of them placed on it. So this is gonna be the base setup required to sort of follow what the scripts are meant to be doing here. If I go to 3D, I just currently have one level. Now I'm just gonna initially just look at these scripts in Dynamo Player. Um, actually, I might follow one in, in Dynamo specifically first. So we're gonna go into this Create Levels script. Now from Revit 2023 onwards, Dynamo Player is a lot better, a lot easier to understand. You can put tooltips on things and icons. You might not see this if you're before 2023, um, but I do recommend trying to get your business to 2023 onwards if you really want to get the most out of Dynamo. I know, backwards compatibility, project versions, long projects. I know, <laughs> it sucks. Um, but if you have the chance, it's good to make this your base version if you can, at least. So I'm just gonna, in this case, open this Dynamo script, which you can do through Manage Dynamo and then open the DYN script file from the GitHub. But in this case, I'll be opening the levels creation script. So as you can see, if I zoom out, I've really kept this script really clean. And I've also uh, added uh, some information about the graph, which if I go to graph properties, you can see I've got an icon, a description, a URL, an author name, and you can add custom properties too. So it's really cool what they've added in 2023 onwards there. But as well as this, I'm also basically grouping my nodes into steps. So personally, I use green for inputs from the user, orange for collecting inputs from the document, purple for functions that don't change the model, blue for functions that do change the model, and pink for outputs. I usually use green just for an about tab or notes, um, which you can always package up and sort of collapse in Dynamo for 2023 onwards. So I'm beginning my script with some nodes. In this case, I've got a number node, a string node, and an integer slider. The number node is collecting a floor to floor height, so the distance between each level. The string is the prefix for the levels, and the integer slider is a number between one and 10 with a step of one. 
that will dictate how many levels I want. So I might just freeze by right clicking and right clicking this node and freezing it so that I don't create any levels, but I'm just gonna run the script once and show what's happening. So the first branch at the top, I'm calculating the top level height by multiplying the number of levels times the numbers, so I'm doing some maths, and then I'm building what's called a range, a special type of object in programming, which starts at a number, ends at a number, and moves at a given step until it reaches the end number. So in this case, I can see I'm moving in increments of four meters until I reach 20. So I've started at zero, four, eight, 12, 16, etc. I've generated an elevation for every level that I could possibly want to create in this workflow. As well as this, I'm creating the level names. So I've created a range that ends at the number of levels I have, so including level zero, which is the default value here. I'm turning this into text, and that's how I can add it or join it onto my prefix, which is level space. So now I have both an equal list of numbers and names to create levels. And I'm using here what's called lists. If you've never seen lists in programming, look at them like objects in a bag in a particular order. You can look at them like a shopping list if you wanna be more literal, but understand that lists can contain lists. You can have deeper, more complex structures if you want to. But at the moment I'm dealing with a very simple single level list. So just a list of names and a list of numbers in the same order. As well as this down the bottom, I've asked the model for all levels. And I'm using here a all elements of class node. So classes aren't something you would really know about unless you've worked with the Revit API or a programming language or concept that supports the concept of a class. But effectively, these are the building blocks of the Revit API. They're all the things that you can collect and do things to. It's more complex than that, but effectively just understand there are a lot of classes of objects in Revit behind the scenes that we can do various things to, such as ask for the name. So I can get all the levels in my model, currently just one level, and ask for its name. Now I do recommend trying to use classes in Revit 2023 onwards in Dynamo if you can, because when you get to the Revit API, it will be a much more direct transition. You can also use categories. They do correlate to built-in categories to some degree behind the scenes in the API, um, but generally I find classes are the best one to try to use where you can, where they exist. So once I have these levels, I'm asking from that list of levels, do any of these items occur? Now this is a very complex syntax here. I'm using what's called list levels and also lacing. So I'm not gonna go too in depth on here, but just understand that the query I'm asking here is in this list of names, which is just currently level zero, do these names exist? And I can see I get true because level zero does exist, but the remainder do not exist, so I get false. And I can use this to mask my data. So what I'm doing here is taking the elevations and also the names and masking or filtering them using a filter by Boolean mask. So Booleans being trues and falses and they mask my data. So anything that's true goes into an in pathway and anything that's false goes into an out pathway. So we can see that zero was true, so I get this in the in list. The remainder are coming out false and sending them forward. One of my favorite nodes in Dynamo. Likewise, I'm doing the same at the top. So now I have all the, the heights and the names for the levels I'd like to create that don't exist in the model by name. So if I unfreeze this, I'm now creating actual elements in Revit. So behind the scenes, I've actually just already generated those five levels separated by four meters from level zero. So I create the levels and then I set their name as a parameter. So now they also get the correct name that I want them to have. From there, I'm also just counting how many things were made, which is five, reporting them to the user in what we call the watch node, which shows up in Dynamo Player because I've, I've right clicked and said is output. And I've also just shown the user the new elements that are created. So I've built the script in a way where if you rerun it, it's only gonna create what needs to be created. So let's say that I wanna to go to level six instead, and I run my script. Well, what's gonna happen here is now I actually have more levels in my model. I have levels zero through to five. 
Likewise, I have level through zero through to six, but we're gonna find out that the model contains all but level six. So we end up just leaving behind the name for level six and the height for level six. And now we only create level six and rename it and report it to the user. So we can see that I've actually protected the script from creating elements that already exist in the model by that name. Now, of course, there's different ways you could go about this. You could also build the script to collect the levels that exist and change their elevation. But this is a really dangerous thing to do in Revit because when you move a level, you can get a lot of errors and warnings. If you move a level that's got the bottom of a wall above the top level of the wall, it's gonna break the wall. There's lots of things that you know just don't work well. And these are things that you have to think about when you're programming and building tools that users might run without really thinking about you know, things that are probably really obvious to us as the programmer, but not so obvious to them as the non-programmer. So I've, I've really thought about that when I built the script and I hope it's really evident and helps as an example of a way you can carefully build a script for a user. Now I can also run this through Dynamo Player. So let's undo the script. So I can actually undo scripts. They're typically captured in transactions, which can be undone in Revit. Um, or roll back if something goes wrong. Um, but I can also click on this, this, this script and I've pointed to the folder where my graphs are stored or my scripts, whatever you want to call it. Now you can see the inputs in Dynamo Player, but we don't see all the nodes. It's much easier, right? So I've got level space as my prefix, top level five, four meters, run, and there's my levels, there's my report, and there's my outputs. So super simple. Very friendly for a user. If I rerun it, all the levels exist. They don't get created. Super simple. Even if I have less levels, they still don't get created. So hopefully that's a useful, quick project initiations, initiation step. Behind the scenes, this script is a little bit more complicated, but it tries to create all floor plans with a, the given level name for a particular view type. So in this case, let's say we want to pick floor plan, no prefix, run, and we can see I've just generated automatically plans for each of those levels. Likewise, ceiling plan, run. Now you could build more view types into this script. I'm using a fixed dropdown in the script, which is unique to 2024 onwards. Um, but you could build every view type in the project, or you could just have every view type hard coded into this to just be generated regardless of whether the user picks it. Just make all views for all types at once. So you, depending on your company standard, you can build these tools to be very, very powerful um, or do a lot of things. Um, it just depends on how flexible you want the tool to be or how rigid your company standards are. If they're very rigid, you can usually automate more with the user picking less. Now this next script actually creates sheets from Excel. So this one will point to an Excel file. So I'll just probably quickly have a look at that file. And Excel is a, a format that a lot of architects, engineers, etc., are really familiar with. They sort of understand what Excel means, so I know that I have two columns here. I know I have rows of data. I know I have two properties, and these are their values. So 2D matrices are a very common data structure in programming that you might be working with, or arrays you could call them sometimes, but in this case, well, arrays of arrays. Of arrays. Um, but in this case, we can basically create these sheets by number and name by breaking down the data in Dynamo and then using it to create the sheets. So I'll run it first and then we'll have a quick look at the script itself. So I'll browse, in this case, to the sheets to create file, point to the worksheet, pick a sheet I want to use the same title block of, and run, and there's the sheets created, named, numbered, etc. But you can imagine that could save a lot of time if you had a document transmittal that already had all this data written into it by someone already, um, very quick, if they already know what they're doing. So let's just delete a few of these. So if I rerun this, it's actually built likewise to only generate new sheets that don't exist by number. I've only created these three and all these ones already exist. So let's quickly have a look at the script behind the scenes. So I'm just gonna delete maybe three of those sheets. And this is a very common script when you're learning Dynamo to build, creating sheets from Excel. It's a task we can mostly relate to if we've used Revit before, uh, but it also shows how Excel and Dynamo go hand in hand. So in this case, I'm gonna pick my Excel path. Uh, I'll just have to quickly jump to that folder. Sheets to create. Pointing to sheet one, so here's my inputs from Dynamo Player. 
and they're going to open the Excel file and I might just freeze the node that creates the sheets for now. Run my script. Now I'm doing a couple of things here. So I get my data, which unfortunately has a header on the front. So you can actually take the first item of a list out using this node built into Dynamo called rest of items. It's a very common task to just take out the first object in a list when dealing with data matrices, because that's usually the headers. From here, I can transpose to flip these together into two lists instead of rows of two objects. So I now have a list of the sheet numbers and a list of the sheet names in the same order. So I've very quickly transformed my data using Dynamo. I can then ask for the first item, which in this case is the list of sheet numbers because I have a list of lists. And then I can ask for the last item or the second object in the list, which is in this case the names. Again, I'm going to be going to get a class, all the what we call view sheets in Revit, which is what the class for sheets is behind the scenes in Revit. Ask them for their number. And then again, I'm asking, do these sheet numbers already exist? And building a Boolean mask to get rid of all the ones that are true. So again, I'm only going to be passing forward what hasn't been created yet. These three numbers and these three names based on that containment check. Underneath here, I'm also asking for all the title blocks on a particular sheet. And I should in this case get hopefully one title block, which I can then use as an input on the sheet by name number title block node. So if I unfreeze this, I should get sheets with the names, the numbers, and that title block, which I can then report to the user. Likewise, I can also report what didn't make it through for sheet numbers at the end, which we didn't actually create. So a very fairly simple, simple script in principle, um, which has really benefited also by some changes in nodes in 2024 as well. For example, this node used to require you to also place a view on the sheet, which obviously isn't great, not really that useful. Um, but now they've created one without the required view. So the next uh, script, which I won't spend too long looking at because it's more complicated, is placing views on sheets. So I've already built an Excel file to guide this process, which at the very least requires the sheet number to place the view on, the name of the view, and the name of the type of the view. So in this case, this is really important because you can have views with the same name of different types. Ceiling plans and floor plans can have the same name, so you could mix them up very easily if all you have to go by is the name of views when you're checking do these views already exist in the model. So in this case, I use the view type to make sure that we can join these together in the script to form what I call a key, and then I can check using these keys instead, do the views with those keys exist, and do the rows in Excel with those keys exist. And I'm effectively going through a very similar process to the sheets workflow to make sure that the sheet numbers don't exist, or like all as I'm making sure the views with those type names and names don't exist as well before I place them. So when I run the script, it's gonna ask me for an Excel file again, which I can pick, a worksheet, and it's gonna ask me for one viewport to use as a placement reference to reference how I should place the other viewports. And I'm actually gonna go and apply a scope box to all these views together. So I'm using a little bit of Revit's capability here um, to make sure these views all have a common crop so that they'll all be placed at the same point. So I wanna select that viewport as my reference viewport and then run, and it's gonna take just a little bit longer because I'm using a bit of Python in this script behind the scenes, which I will show briefly. Um, you could use a custom package to do this. There's a lot of uh, custom packages with a viewport creation node such as Rhythm or Crumple. Um, so don't feel like you do have to use Python to do a workflow like this. But what's just happened is we've placed the respective views on their respective sheet. And you can imagine if that was a multi-residential tower project, say a 40-story tower with 12 plan types, that obviously would be a huge time saving. And of course, if you have different placement positions for different levels, you could complicate the script and add a type of viewport to reference. Say a sheet, grab the first plan off this sheet, use its location. If you have different zones, different scope boxes, it's always possible to make the script do more. It's just more work, of course. Um, I might briefly just show how I've used Python and also code blocks in this script. But of course, you can view it if you got it from GitHub.
So, behind the scenes, we should be able to see what's going on. So I'll skip most of the logic here. Again, we're just getting Excel data, but um, what's happening here is I'm getting all plans in the model, filtering out any plan templates because they happen to fall into the same class. Bit weird, but you learn those things over time in Dynamo. Um, I'm using here what's called a code block, which allows me to use a syntax called design script, which allows me to reference Dynamo functions or nodes um, by name instead. And this can sometimes save time because I'm obviously doing multiple steps in a single node um, and I'm creating variables. I can see I've just created this views variable that gets referenced immediately. So if I create a variable called A, I can see A appears. So code blocks are a special environment that are sort of like an in-between environment between Dynamo and Python and C-sharp. They're a really good bridge if you're starting to learn about written programming but you're not quite ready to look at full-blown Revit API and Python. And this is where I'm doing things like taking a view's name, but then also getting the view's type and adding its type's name to form a list of keys instead. This is how I can combine the type and the name to make something that's definitely unique about the, about the view so that we don't mix up ceiling plans with floor plans. But I'm also later on in the script actually placing views on sheets. So I'm getting a viewport, I'm getting, in this case, a list of views and a list of sheets to place those views on. And Python's a little bit more complicated. So it's written programming, it's using the Revit API, so I'm calling in various areas of the Revit API, various references behind the scenes or DLLs that form the Revit API. Um, and then I'm also doing things like calling on the active document. So I'm doing things that aren't necessarily the same as Dynamo, but Dynamo is very capable of doing these things. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but we can do things such as call on methods that we can apply to objects to generate new objects. So in this case, I'm asking the viewport for its box center, which by default isn't available in most versions of Dynamo without custom packages. I can also do things like check if I can create a viewport before I create it. So to avoid creating an error, I can start using logic. I can say, if I could make this viewport, make it. Otherwise, report that it's an error or a failure. And at the end, we send the failures forward to be reported. So we can do a lot more complex things in this environment. I'm also doing things such as setting the label offset of the viewport to make sure that the title is in the same position and the same length. So I can do a lot of really interesting things using Python and the Revit API, but this will take time to get to for you. So don't feel like you have to start using Python straight away. In fact, I recommend you don't. Um, learn Dynamo first and then build your way up to it. And then finally, I break the outputs of Python and put them into watch outputs. So we've seen a few fairly uh, valuable scripts here that can obviously do very scalable tasks, very repeatable tasks, um, and might form some effective building blocks for your learning, I hope. Um, the last script is really just to show that you can generate custom interfaces. So I'm using the data shapes package here and also the crumple package um, to generate this interface and apply revisions to multiple views. So I'm using a pretty different interface to Dynamo Player here, but I can see now that I've just bulk revisioned five sheets. I haven't revisioned the other ones, but I have added this revision to these five sheets. And behind the scenes, I'm using what's called custom nodes from a custom package. And these nodes also use Python-based nodes, use Python, sorry. So you can actually open them and look at them and try to understand how they work and start learning about them. So for example, this is a node from Data Shapes that generates a drop-down object to be received by another node later on. So behind the scenes, these actually typically contain Python code in most cases. And we can see there's you know a lot of fairly complex code in there. In this case, this is actually just packaging up an object for a later node to unpack and build into a portion of an interface. So I've got a drop-down component here, which is getting all the revisions, and then a list view, getting all the sheets. And then this is the main interface that Data Shape supports. There's thousands of lines of code in there. And then I'm processing them using a code block and then running the output through a node from Crumple to add the revisions to the sheet as long as we didn't cancel. And then finally just reporting anything that wasn't revisioned using a difference on what was revisioned and what was sent through to report the output.
So it's a fairly different approach and nearly every single node you see there is custom. So you would need those custom packages on your machine in order to support the script. Um, but just to show you what is possible if you get a little bit further down the line in Dynamo. So I hope you find those scripts useful and enjoyable um, in your learning journey. Just a reminder that you can access them on my GitHub uh, under the Dynamo repo or repository um, using uh, this zip file here. So that about wraps up um, the, the demonstration component. Um, so thank you again to Capricot for inviting me initially to present, um, but also for you for watching. And if you have any questions about Dynamo, of course, um, let me know. I'm always happy to address them uh, in the chat or by email. Um, and of course, uh, I will try to come back and make some videos eventually. I've uh, just been very busy um, and, you know, a few technical challenges with my, with my setup that have made it difficult. And uh, I look forward to seeing some of you shortly on uh, Revit Pure, where we'll be doing a wrap-up episode. So do uh, feel free to join us on there if you'd like to hear about the year gone by with BIM and what's to come. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in future similar presentations and videos. So thanks. Um, take care. Bye.